they were straight, were bisexual. Uh, they came from all over. So that if HIV got into that group, that community of people, then we are in a very big risk of this becoming a general problem. We just put up uh, a notice around uh, St Vincent's Hospital and the, the King's Cross area that a group of us would be meeting together to uh, talk about uh, the AIDS epidemic and we invited injecting drug users and uh, people who were interested in injecting drug use to come along. I thought here was just another little trumped up researcher come to experiment with the guinea pigs. Uh, you know, we were just being going to be treated like guinea pigs. A number of us uh, rocked up to that first meeting and there were, there were nuns and they were injecting drug users and there were whores and there were doctors and there were uh, social workers and, you know, what a crew. We had no idea how extensive needle sharing was because it wasn't something that anyone was interested in or ever documented. Uh, well, I used to share needles quite a bit in those, in those early days. You know, it was more by luck than consistent good management that, you know, I ever had a clean needle. We started reading about the fact that needle syringe programs were beginning in Britain under the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher and in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Wodak and his group began to lobby for permission to run the country's first official needle exchange. This was a matter for the state government, where the politics of drugs were played for all they were worth. It just undermines the whole idea we're trying to do all we can to win the war against drugs. It's like you do one thing in one direction, you go the opposite direction in, 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 on other policies. And I think that just causes confusion. It was so obvious to me that what we were asking for, what we were begging for, was absolutely right. And yet people left, right and centre were opposing us as though we were madmen. While Wodak was filing submissions to run his needle exchange, the hopes of prevention suddenly collapsed. Infections quadrupled into the thousands. Friends began to get sick. This is um, painful to talk about, and it's also hard for me to accurately recall it. And I think that says something about the trauma of the time. There'd be people being wheeled up and down Oxford Street in wheelchairs. You'd see the physical um, devastation on, 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 on people's bodies with a wasting disease. Um, you'd, you'd, you'd see that the look in the eyes when I would say, you know, they, they can see God, they're looking to God, you know. There was a, a sense that their, their lives were, were ending. Most of them ended up at the same hospital the New York gardener had come to only three years before, St Vincent's. All the fear and panic that had gathered around the virus came with them. Some of the kitchen staff knew they were taking food up to the AIDS ward, so they'd leave it at the, uh, at the doorway. Um, I mean, I don't... I can't say I liked it, but, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we overcame as much as you, you could. I was terrified. And it's so, I mean, it's so completely irrational, but that's, how, that's, the, the, that's the actual fact of it. And I was really, really very frightened. And don't ask me what I was frightened of, because I couldn't tell you. But these were local people. The Sisters of Charity who ran St Vincent's took a decision to become a dedicated AIDS hospital. Their patients faced a merciless death. By taking out the immune system, AIDS exposed them to every contractable illness from cancers normally seen in cats to simple but unstoppable thrush. These were very young men and there were such a lot of them. And I can remember, to my dying day, I will remember this young man who came in on his first admission and he was, he was in a six bed unit. And he was looking across to this gaunt, extremely ill man in the bed opposite. And you could see in his head, this is what I'm going to be like in a little while. This is going to be me. I think a lot of people thought, thought, you know, what Pandora's box have we opened? We've got, you know, gay abandon, literally, and now look where we are. There's this epidemic in the very community that we've fought to make 
Some people said that to me, I'm being punished, I'm being punished, which was particularly difficult for them. It's bad enough to be so ill, let alone to feel this is some kind of punishment. For some that had been estranged from their families, it brought them back together with their families. You know, at this... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I just thought of a... I thought of a woman who... Um, the rest of her family wouldn't talk to her brother. So she came down from a country town, left her five kids in the care of her husband. And she lived with her brother and looked after him till he died. With no, no support at all from the family. And he just got the bastard sinner. You know? uh, and entirely, based entirely on prejudice. Just outside the hospital, the world had changed for all three of the local tribes. People having their houses, uh, windows stoned, having signs painted across their, their, their front, front doors and the walls of their houses, AIDS whore die or AIDS poof to die. Die junkie AIDS. Eggs being thrown out of cars and tomatoes at sex workers on William Street. You know, the, the blame game was on full bore. Huge increase in the rate of gay bashings going on around the hospital. So I go down to the emergency department, but I get down there and look around, there'd be these other gay men with cut bruises and fractures and it was so distressing. There are many times when it felt like we were not going to survive. We object to the exclusive use of a pool, of a public pool, for a homosexual swimming festival, especially in the midst of an AIDS epidemic. There were calls to reopen quarantine camps, calls to stop gay men leaving or entering the country. Then, the head of the National AIDS Task Force called for the closure of Mardi Gras itself. Well, I was concerned that uh, male homosexual men, but also particularly bisexual men, would be likely to be visiting Sydney to participate in the sort of extreme promiscuous sex. For the gay community, this was the line in the sand. All those debates were about we're scum. We should go and hide. We should, no, we shouldn't. We should be fighting harder, or at least like to, to show that we're, we are human. You shouldn't underestimate the anger that was around in the 80s and 90s that was driving the response. We were angry that our friends were dying. We were angry that we were sick. Tell me why! Tell me why! For one night, hundreds of thousands put aside their fear of the plague and came to watch. It shows that the people of Sydney have not been scared by the Festival of Life propaganda and have come out and shown their support for the gay community. Only two years before, the Mardi Gras slogan was on our way to freedom. In 1985, it was fighting for our lives. Tell me why. That year, Bill Whitaker tested positive for HIV. Most of us by then really didn't have a clear idea of how much time one would have, and you probably thought in shorter terms rather than longer terms. And for me, that made me, I think, more driven. Don Baxter was negative. I think what I did in, in those years, especially when numbers of friends, my, friend, my friends started to get sick, was become quite hard and not allow uh, 